Hi, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's uh, In Search of Purpose talk. Um, this, as uh, our regular um, audience will realize and uh, for those of you who are new, um, big welcome. This is in fact our 26th In Search of Purpose talk. Uh, my name is Darren, I'm usually your MC. I'll be your guest host tonight as well. And I'm looking forward very much uh, to it. As you know, the In Search of Purpose talk is a series where we invite um, speakers, whether overseas or from Singapore, who have uh, inspiring life stories or experiences to share, um, hopefully to motivate um, young adults and uh, young people, both in the central Singapore district as well as outside, to themselves lead uh, inspiring stories and to positively um, affect others. Now, uh, this is the first online In Search of Purpose that uh, we've had. So it's just not a new experience for you, it's a new experience for me as well. And I hope we enjoy it uh, together. I hope that all of you are safely sheltering in place. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, uh, although it's a, a different uh, environment than we had before, nothing changes. Um, we're here to listen to our guest speak and, and also to uh, share her experiences and uh, ask her questions. Now, for those of you who've missed our first 25 In Search of Purpose talks uh, or are unable to make it for future sessions, um, the talk series is available online on our YouTube channel, In Search of Purpose Talks. And uh, you will be able to see this talk as well um, at a later time. But uh, please do enjoy our earlier episodes. Uh, the other thing that I uh, would highlight is that In Search of Purpose is just one of the 52 programs that Central Singapore CDC runs. Um, if you want to find out more, uh, you're already on our Facebook page. Please uh, do look at the programs that we run. I think you'll find them very meaningful. All right. Now that we've gotten the uh, administrative uh, matters out of the way, uh, this is the first time that I'm not asking people to silence their handphones uh, um, and beeping devices. Uh, in fact, please keep your volume on because uh, this, this is where I introduce uh, our, our speaker. Now, uh, we're very honoured to have with us Ms. Nitko Ng, um, co-founder of The Food Bank Singapore, to share her story with us. A very special guest we have tonight. Please give it up for Ms. Nicole. Hi, everyone. Yes, um, um, so firstly, thank you for having me on this evening. Uh, I am going to present you some slides to share a little bit more about my story. Um, so that's why the, heading, uh, the header today on my presentation is what's my story, right? So all of you are really listening in because you genuinely want to know, you know, so what's behind her story? Um, so I would like to start off by saying, um, firstly, a lot of us who actually attend these talks, right, whether it's at TED Talks or any other seminars and presentations, you always see the speaker as someone like, oh, likely she's very successful, which is why she has the time and the money to do charity work, you know, and a whole host of things. Uh, but today, I'd like to share with you my journey on uh, the road that I've taken over the last 42 years. And um, if I can just put it out there, um, I will welcome any questions that you may have. Uh, nothing is uh, out of uh, bounds, so to say. And so it makes life easier for Darren as well when I help him to answer the questions that will go his way. Uh, and so firstly, thank you for all of you, you know, for logging in. Uh, a lot of us have been cooped up at home but not myself because I'm in the essential business. So I've actually been going to work every single day. So whether it's for the food distribution or from the food bank's perspective, um, I would like to say that food is pivotal to my life. Uh, and actually it has taken on uh, quite an interesting role. Uh, and I would like to start by, you know, sharing some slides with you. So firstly, um, if you ask me what's the purpose in my life, maybe it's to correct the wrong that was already made from the time that I was born. So when I say that, it's because if you notice my Nicole, it was, it, it's not your traditional spelling. It's usually N-I-C-O-L-E. But my late daddy, who I love to bits, have made the mistake from birth that <laughs> in a rush, you know, I guess he even spelled my name wrongly. And I've lived with this error for all my life. But it's interesting 
because a lot of people who have never met me before, they think that I'm a male. Uh, and, I, and I guess it was just a prelude for my younger brother, uh, who actually came 18 months later. So my dad just did the lazy thing by adding an AS at the end. And uh, that's how we got to be, and maybe that also explains the closeness that I have with the only sibling that I have, which is my brother. Um, so anyway, Nicole, um, I have to bring attention to my Chinese name as well. Uh, and so the, the meaning behind it really is, uh, I, th I guess when my parents gave me the name, is that I was out to do something greater than who I am. And if you, for those of you out there who can read Chinese, the thing is something that's very feminine. So the way is something that's very masculine. So together with the error in my English name, I have become a, a crossbreed between female and male, so which is why I have quite a strong personality. Uh, so for anybody who is you know, expecting your first child and thinking what name to name, so remember, the name makes all the impact on that little one, okay? Um, yeah, and with that, this is who I was when I, when I was born, right? So um, there's only two of us because it was the Stop at Two campaign. I think my parents would have loved to have a lot more children, <laughs> but they were quite worried that a lot of them wouldn't get into good schools. So they decided to be the good citizen and stop that too. So it's just me uh, and, and my brother from very young. Um, and on this note, I'd like to say that um, maybe some of you would know or would not know if you have read my story somewhere before that food played a very big role. And it actually started because um, I was always bigger built than other girls. Uh, and uh, at the age of like five years old, uh, if any of you uh, have, uh, are old enough to remember, but there was this Nespray commercial uh, about a ballerina. And I will sing a little bit right now. Uh, like it, it goes like, you're my best little girl, you're my pride and my joy. And then it goes, you know, showing this perfect little girl in that slender body in a ballerina outfit. You know, and that depicted how I wanted to be, this perfect little girl, you know, like beautiful and graceful and all that. Uh, but because I was bigger built than a lot of girls out there, every Chinese New Year I was asked this question. Uh, hey, you know, did you steal your brother's food? Or, and you know, they, they always tend to compare. And so therefore, since I was five years old, and after being rejected from a very famous ballet school, yeah, I wouldn't name names, um, but they actually told me and my mom off that, hey, I'm sorry, but your daughter is too fat to be a ballerina. And um, I'm just so thankful that I have parents that love me for who I am, regardless and I wasn't I wasn't even obese okay I was just much bigger built you know and but they just felt that the teacher felt that I couldn't fit into a, a leotard you know perfectly per, for example and um, so when I mentioned that is because that actually led me to being very particular about how I look and um, I have stumbled upon eating disorder since I was 11 years old and but the seed was planted from that age when you see in the photographs right now so that the, the picture in the middle is actually me in my nursery uniform. Please don't ask me why the skirt is so short. Okay, I've got to ask my parents that. But um, it's really because uh, I think I was really taller than a lot of the kids out there. You know, and uh, the picture on the, on the right is actually me and my brother. And we are only 18 months apart. But you can see he was this fussy little boy, you know, and so he wasn't growing that well. You know, and boys develop later. So a lot of people are asking, you know, how come, you know, your brother is so much tinier than you are? And this set the tone um, for me to get on a diet. Uh, and um, it's, it's quite amazing. So food was pivotal to that, right? Um, so now I will show you. And uh, as I was growing up, I was very uh, lucky because um, I attended a very good school. I was uh, in a bilingual SAP school for 10 years. Uh, so yes, I'm effectively bilingual, although I look like a potato on the outside, but I'm really not. Um, and uh, the, the school actually cultivated a lot of sense of responsibility in me. So today's mission or, or the topic of today is like, what's my story? And importantly, in search of purpose, right? So it was actually my late grandmother who actually told me from when I was very young age, uh, why are you always so capable? So I'll explain to you why I'm very capable because since I was like five years old, I've also wanted to be the class leader. I've always led a very active life, whether it's in terms of a student leader or helping the teachers, helping my classmates and all that. And all the way since primary school, I've, take, uh, I've taken on leadership positions, you know, simply because I was capable. Um, 
So I was the head prefect in primary school. I was the head prefect in secondary school. I was the head counsellor in my college years. Uh, and subsequently, when I went to NUS, I was uh, the vice president of the Students' Union. Uh, and now, actually, everyone is asking me, when are you going to join politics, right? So, uh, not so soon, okay? So, <laughs> you won't be seeing my face anytime, okay? So, but anyway, uh, being the capo nature that I was, I've always taken a very active approach. So, I mentioned about eating disorder earlier on. And I have to mention this photo here, when I mentioned Banana Rama days. That was the photo when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And that was really the onset of my eating disorder because I was very aware and that was when all the tabloids came about as well and I actually picked up wrong things from, from what the tabloids were showing, right? Like, they were actually telling us like how not to become anorexic or how not to become bulimic but when I read the magazines, I basically picked up all the wrong things. Um, uh, and, but a lot of you may not know, an eating disorder is really not about looking good. It's, uh, it's a mental illness. And um, from a young age, I've also been quite a perfectionist. So I try my best to, you know, fulfill everything, every role, every responsibility. Um, and by having this added weight of an eating disorder, I've also become a control freak through my life. It's just that in other areas, you know, maybe people might abuse alcohol or, you know, they might be a gambler. But for anybody who is an eating disorder, for those of you who are interested to know, it's just that we use food as a way of controlling things. Uh, for myself, it's, uh, it was interesting, I was in a top girls school, but I've never been in a top class. So I've always been at the bottom of a top school, so you can imagine how stressful it is. I also have my uh, ex-principal to thank, because from early on, she actually told my mom when I was like 8 years old, right? And she said, hey, you know, Catherine, um, let me share with you, your daughter's grades uh, will likely not be so good, but she has a calling in life. So from eight, nine years old, I don't know what my principal saw in me, but she actually said that she likely will have uh, another purpose in life. But it's not about fulfilling like all A1s, but it's about doing something special. Uh, and, and so I guess from very young, um, I had nurturing parents, I had great teachers, and I also had a principal that saw something in me, and including my, my grandma as well. And so now when I got to secondary school, um, I was... Um, actively involved, you know, I was in a softball school team, I was uh, the ABA pro vice president, you know. Uh, for those of you who are really young, you'll be wondering what's ABA, right? So like, the media that you know today, you know, so we were the times, you know, when we went to the hall and connected the mics <laughs> and tried to learn about photography, you know, there was no mobile phones with cameras back then, and that was the ABA club was all about, okay? So I had a diversified interest, I love to cook. Uh, it was uh, part of the eating disorder that I have as well. Uh, but I have to mention my secondary school days because um, the photo at the bottom, it's my, uh, my dad, my brother. You know, that was my graduation photo. As you can see, that was at the peak of how heavy I was, you know. Uh, and yes, all of us had to wear ugly white dresses because <laughs> it was a convent school. So we had to, you know, at least knee length and all that. And I was a very big child. So I was like, you know, how to fit it nicely into a dress, right? So my mom had to tailor make something for me. And um, at this point, I also wanted to share that, um, uh, like all of you know, I actually came from a food business, right? So my grandfather came from Swatow, China in 1939. Uh, after his first wife passed away uh, and he brought his uh, younger daughter with him. So in survival, before World War II, he was, you know, he came all the way to Singapore on a junk boat trying to, in search for a better living, right? Uh, so subsequently he met my grandma uh, and they had nine children and they were all brought up in a shop house. Uh, and uh, don't tell me how, no, no family planning, nothing, but it was three boys, three girls, three boys, all one year apart, perfectly healthy, and all brought up in this tiny little shop house. Um, and so my grandfather actually started the business uh, by serving all the roadside hawkers, you know, and back in the day, you know, there was no SFA or anything. Uh, and uh, in the 60s, when the hotel started booming in Singapore, my older uncles actually took over the business and they started diversifying into Western food. Um, ingredients, which is something that we carry right now. Uh, and where was my dad? My dad was the second youngest of uh, this family of nine. So at age 15, he actually dropped out of school. Uh, my dad till today is one of the most amazing entrepreneurial men that I've, uh, I've never met. My biggest regret in life is really not, um, uh, not being in time to write a book about him. 
So in the 80s, when uh, Singapore was, you know, in the booming stages, it's beginning to open up as a free port and all that, uh, my dad was one of the entrepreneurial people who actually dabbled in all kinds of business. So he left the food business to be ran by my uncles, you know, at that point, my grandfather has also passed on already. Uh, and so he started a trading company. Um, so what did he do? He, we did everything from opening the first duty-free shop in Maldives, uh, to uh, we, we had a perfume trading business in Switzerland. We did movie making. So my dad actually did uh, Hong Kong movies back in the day when EDB was opening their doors. Uh, we were building bungalows. You know, we had uh, more than 25 offices all around the world. Uh, and we, I was having a very comfortable upbringing, right? Very comfortable life. And if those of you who are old enough to remember, in 1997, we were basically hit by the biggest um, Asian currency crisis. So other than the oil crisis in the 1980s, the next crisis that hit us and it hit Singapore is basically in 1997, when for the first time, the whole of Asia was hit by this currency crisis. And my dad was affected as well. So imagine building a, a, an empire. And that time I was like 16, 17 years old. Um, so at that, at that point in time, the entire empire was, was uh, the, re the revenue was about 250 million US dollars, which about in today's terms is going to be about a billion dollars. Yeah, uh, our head office was actually in Orchard Road. Yeah, and, uh, and so in 97, what happened was my dad became bankrupt. We actually lost every single business that we had. Uh, so I was there when the banks came to seize the house. It's exactly like what you see on TV. You know, someone comes with a piece of paper and a guard and they give you 30 minutes to pack whatever you have. So coming from a very comfortable upbringing and being there by my parents' side when this happened, I'm just very thankful for one thing. And I think for any of you out there who's searching your purpose, um, is that my parents never brought me up spoiled. They, brought, they did pamper us, but we were never spoiled. So when that happened, you know, I just stood by my dad and told my daddy, like, do what you need to, you know, uh, as long as we have a roof over our heads, that's good enough. So my, we lost our family home. I was there when my mom's Mercedes was towed away. And being a very impressionable 17, 18 year old person, um, I realized from very early on that I cannot take anything for granted. So uh, in, that was in college. And uh, when I entered university, right, Okay, so firstly, I have to share this slide, huh? my college days. So my, my first boyfriend is one of those three guys, and I won't tell you who it is, but <laughs> uh, that was my days in CJC. Uh, and uh, those were interesting days, you know, uh, paired with the bankruptcy, you know, and being first time in a co-ed school. Uh, those were interesting days. And then I went to NUS, okay? Uh, I, 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 it was a tough time, and that was the first time I felt like I had to sacrifice because of what happened to my father. Um, my brother, whose Chinese was terrible, and I, if he's watching this and he knows it for sure, he was packed off to a boarding school when he was 15. So my mom being one of those kiasu Chinese mothers, right? Well, he already packed him off because in fear of uh, not doing well for O-levels. Uh, at 15, he was packed off to Australia for boarding school. And so he, had, he was determined to finish his studies overseas. But I was good enough to like, you know, uh, continue my studies in Singapore. And so my dad, who said that, hey, hey girl, you know, I cannot afford to send you to Switzerland to study hospitality, which was what I wanted to do. Um, he said, can you please study in Singapore? Because um, I needed to use my CPF money to pay for your fees. Uh, and um, so I felt for the first time that being the eldest, you know, and the sister and the daughter of the family, I had to take on this responsibility to sacrifice my own dreams. My grades were not good enough to enter business school. So I just did arts, you know, I studied economics. Uh, I, other than my dad using his CPF to pay for my school fees, I basically earned my own allowance by working part-time. So for anybody that knew me in secondary school, you know, I was this flashy girl, you know, who, who was changing Swatch watches every day simply because my, my dad was a duty-free uh, franchisee, you know, and we were like the distributor for Swatch watches as well. And coming to NUS and I had to earn part-time, you know, I was working part-time, whether is it teaching or whether is it uh, working in a cafe, you know, earning $4 an hour, uh, which was unheard of now. <laughs> um, and uh, so I felt that I had put myself through school and I was very thankful at that point. I also met my current husband. So I, we've been together for 23 years, you know, and later on you'll see him in the slides. But um, the people that you surround yourself with. So I had a good bunch of girlfriends that I've met since I was seven years old. We are still very close right now. 
actually enabled me to to find my my calling or my purpose in life. So I think in NUS, you know, because my mom knew that my grades were crap anyway, um, so she said, you know, girl, go and do whatever you want to see if you can hone your leadership skills. And so that was what I did. So in NUS, I was hard, I was not staying in the hall. Thank God, you know, my dad, my mom said, oh, I thank God she didn't stay in the hall. She saw very very little of me because at any time, like freshman orientation, I was juggling like six projects at one time. So I was literally not at home, right? You know, uh, and therefore, you know, moving on to my next job, you know, after I graduated from NUS, I was very thankful I graduated on time. In year two thousand, uh, that's when the IT bubble burst. So it was. After the 97 crisis, I was in school, year 2000, the IT bubble burst and it was like in between, you know, when the Yahoo days, you know, and that, that first IT bubble, right? It was very difficult to look for a job, you know, and so back in the day, it wasn't that long ago, like 20 years ago, right? But when you graduated back in the time, you had to photocopy your resume. So I remembered because of the situation that our family was in. Uh, I, I printed more than a hundred copies of my resume to send out hard copy. You know, I, I don't know how much I spent on snail mail, but you know, you would buy those large brown envelopes and put your <laughs> graduation cert inside in black and white, not even color copy, uh, it was black and white. And then I mailed out to whatever jobs that I could find. And um, I was very lucky. I was offered a job at MediaCorp. So back in the day, it wasn't MediaCorp. It was uh, still TCS and RCS. Uh, and uh, I was there at the turning point when MediaWorks was there and uh, they actually offered me a job although I wasn't I didn't study marketing at all uh, but this is another point where I was actually blessed with my first set of managers who actually taught me everything that I knew about advertising uh, so anything that you feel that I've done a good job in terms of branding be it like for food bank or for for my current company right now um, was all thanks to my first set of managers so I, I think whoever that comes your way um, guides you along into finding your, your, your target in your life or in enabling you to find your strengths as well, like who you're, what, what actually are you good at. And so in my first job, I realized I was very good in marketing, although I didn't study it. I had lots of ideas, I was creative as well. And at this point, um, I was also at the peak of my eating disorder. So throughout my growing up years, coming back to that story, if you remember, I started this journey of being bulimic uh, and sometimes anorexic at 11 years old. So I've spent more than 10 years of my life starving myself. So at my peak, I had five days without food. So yes, you can survive five days, no food. Um, I was surviving on water. Uh, and it was actually my colleagues uh, in my first job that enabled me to seek help because I was very open about talking about my problem. Uh, and back in the day, you know, none of the doctors knew what eating disorder really was all about. And um, I actually found my first calling when I managed to seek help at 22, I remembered. I quit my first job. Uh, I took a two months um, break, so to say, in search of myself. Mm. Uh, because part of the, the, the problem with an eating disorder is that you're very much in the routine already. You know, you kind of lost yourself to the illness. So the doctors say the best thing that you can do for yourself right now is to take a break because I've consistently been on the go. And so I took a break in search of myself, right? Uh, sounds very close to the topic, right, for this talk. Um, so I took two months off, you know, and it was for the first time that I focused on myself internally. Actually, what, who am I? What am I about? Am I just about being a good girl? Am I about living up to my parents' expectations? You know, what does it mean being a daughter? Uh, be, being a female in the industry, do I really have to be slim, tall, you know, like glamorous all the time? So what does it mean? And so I gave myself that break and uh, I left my first job. And um, the, the, the thing is that, so this is what I did. So my mom actually uh, uh, signed me up for her world, the most beautiful people or something like that, you know, like, so I, I, I was very surprised that I was shortlisted, you know, I was one of the 50 people. and. In between taking a break, I basically did everything crazy. And that was the time when there was like, you know, live shows, you know, you follow someone. So that's Wong Lilin, if you want to know. So I, I actually joined this media cop series where, you know, I went for 14 days to Australia, like testing out myself. And the camera crew was with me all the time to see, you know, how you can compete, you know, and we were supposed to be the last man standing.
thing, you know, at the end, and you get a very small price, like, it's not like a million dollars or something. I think it was like 10,000 or 5,000 um, dollars. But I did everything to challenge myself and to test myself because I gave myself that window of opportunity to search for something, to try for something. Because I know that the next job that I will get will likely be something that I'll be seriously crafting my career in. And so in between that, in 2002 came another crisis. That was 18 years ago. And SARS hit Singapore. I have to share this because obviously it's very close to all our hearts right now, right? Um, but that was also the time when the whole F&B industry was trying to digitize themselves for the first time. Uh, and my dad said, hey, you know, I really need help in uh, the business. So my dad, if you remember all the bankruptcy thing, so we lost everything. The only business that my dad could ring fence was my grandfather's business. And you know, it was like a $5 million turnover, very small turnover compared to everything else. But it gave my uncles and my dad something to sustain and to continue. And um, as a company, we were already an old timer in food distribution. So my dad said, hey, can you come back and help me to put computers in the business? And mind you, I'm an IT idiot till today. I really don't like IT. So, um, but I said, sure. Being um, very close to my family, I said, definitely that I will come back. So I, 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 I quit, you know, uh, traveling around and doing all this crazy stuff. And I came back to the family business and I, I didn't look back since then. Um, at this juncture, I need to really say uh, that my uncle only gave me one year to survive in the trade because it was a male-dominated industry. So I was working with a lot of business owners that are far older than I was. They're all male. Uh, secondly, most of the executive chefs still today, they're also male. And so for the first time, Ng Chai Mong, uh, Wang Zai Mao, as we call it, um, my, the, the food distribution business had our first salesperson, and that was me. And I was the youngest employee. Uh, then I was here to learn. I wanted to make a change to the business. Um, but before I get there, let me um, finish my personal story first. Um, so that's my husband. Uh, actually, in fact, tomorrow we're celebrating our 10th wedding anniversary. So we've been married for 10 years, but we've been together since 1997. And um, that itself is a story that would take like probably another two hours, but I won't, I won't use two hours for that. Till today, my, my husband is my greatest cheerleader. He is my soulmate. Um, I would consider him my best male friend because I've got a best girlfriend. <laughs> uh, and um, we have honed our relationship through lots of ups and downs. Our relationship is not perfect at all. Um, we, we went through a lot of hardships because he came from a background that's completely different. His family setup was also very, very different. Um, but somehow when we decided to get married, and that was the time that I decided to sacrifice for my spouse um, because I had to convert. So maybe not a lot of you know, but um, I, I told my husband, if we are to marry, it is only right and respectful of me to be able to embrace your religion as well. And so that's what I did. Uh, and that was 10 years ago, if you want to see. We had the most fabulous wedding ever. It was like 48 hours, two days, because we had to like both sides. Uh, so we had the full traditional Chinese wedding, you know, from the morning, you know, he came with all the Chinese ceremonial, tea ceremony, gate crashing and all that. Uh, we actually, in fact, he changed more outfits than I did because he's more vain than I am. <laughs> uh, so, but we had the full suite of things, you know, uh, so both sides. And I would always remember there was a minister that, um, that, that came, you know, this, this, uh, this reverend of sorts that helped us to have that, that civil marriage as well, where um, he said something very beautiful. He said, Nicole and uh, Eddie, you have to remember that it's, your marriage is, uh, is basically a marriage of cultures. It's not even about the religion or about two people. It is about two different cultures coming together. And that's the most beautiful thing. And so we decided from that point on that we had to share our story because it's not every day that people would really talk about it. Two very different people. I'm very patient. He's completely impatient. He's completely hot-tempered. He is the funny one. I'm, I'm the very serious one. And basically, I'm the mother of the family and I've got five kids now, including him. So that's something that I always say. So this was at our uh, wedding dinner, you know, and the next day we had the, the whole uh, Malay side of things. He, his mom was Indian, so I wore the sari as well. It was the most fun 48 hours we've ever had. And of course, with fun, um, of course, we have to decide to have kids, right? Um, so firstly, I would also like to declare that 
a lot of people have asked me, is it because your husband's side of the family has been forcing you to have so many kids? So let me make it very clear. My biggest purpose in life is to be a mother. And in fact, I wanted to have minimally six. Okay, so I don't know if I'm on my track to getting six, but uh, I think I'm a little bit old for that. But um, my, my biggest dream was to have six children minimally. In fact, it was my husband who said that he doesn't like kids at all. So I had to brainwash him to be on this paternal journey. And, uh, but he has thanked me for that because he had the best Father's Day <laughs> last weekend. Um, and uh, I think our greatest calling in life, and we always say that the legacy, that the only legacy that we leave behind really is our children. Uh, and so uh, now I have four, in case you want to know. Um, my eldest is actually seven and a half, and my youngest is actually um, six months. So let me show you. Um, so we had, you know, we now have three girls, uh, one boy, um, and in between we lost one as well. Uh, but if not, I, I would be having five now. So I'm thinking, you know, I should have five, you know, like. <laughs> so instead, uh, other than running so many businesses, two charities, and all that, um, my biggest joy and my first role, other than being a wife, really is be to to be a mother. In fact, today I'm very tired because last night I only had one hour of sleep, which is two hours short of my usual quota. <laughs> Because I do the night shift myself, you know, my, my youngest is currently teething. She's already got four, four teeth at six months plus. Um, and, uh, but I really, really enjoy uh, being a mom. So you would ask me, how does my youngest look like? So that's her in, mm. in the high chair. Uh, and oh. she, she is a foodie by itself because, you know, she loves her food. And I, I started feeding her solids at four months. Uh, but we have a beautiful family. And um, I, I say this from the bottom of my heart, despite having three hours of sleep. <laughs> and imagine being um, someone with eating disorder. So now, every day, I start my day with a black cup of coffee. I only eat once a day and three hours of sleep. But between my entire company and maybe myself and my husband, I'm the energizer bunny. So I am like very, uh, as uh, Chinese would say, I can save money a lot. I eat very little, I sleep very little, but I can generate a lot of energy. So that's something. If some of you are asking like, how does she actually do it? So that's one of the tips. Um, and now, just to end that part about eating disorder, uh, one of the first things that I also did when I managed to seek help before I even go to the business was I decided early on when I was at my first support group for my eating disorder that I have to reach out to more people to talk about this eating disorder problem because it was so taboo, right? So one of my callings as well to, in search of my purpose, one of the purpose that I have set out is I need to change people's impression of what eating disorder is all about. It's nothing taboo. It's nothing bad to talk about. Um, in fact, the earlier you address it, the, the faster you get help. You know, and so when I was so blessed to be able to find the doctor that helped me to, to be on track for my recovery, I said, I really need to help more people by setting up a support group. And back in the day, nobody really talks about eating disorder. Even till today, you know, it's not something that you openly talk about. But I think being a modern female, even a modern male of today, and, and the pressures that we actually feel, um, eating disorder is something that many of us face but it's just that we don't talk about it and in fact you might see a lot of successful women and men suffering from it because it's our way of controlling our life so um so that was one of the first purpose that i set out to do so i set up the support group for eating disorders when i was 21 and the next purpose that i actually called out for myself is how can i extend my grandfather's business beyond the 70 and 80 years um, I wanted to continue the legacy of my grandfather, although I've never met him before, for another hundred years. So in order for me to do that, and, and because of all the past bankruptcy cases and everything else, I, I took a bold move. It was a very daring move because we were, we were already an old and established name. Was um, I actually, in fact, started, we set up food services and we acquired the family business. So we are a third generation business with a very interesting story because we are like a startup, but in an 80 year old body. That's always how we describe ourselves. Mm. Uh, and X Inc is a group of companies that I actually uh, manage together with my brother right now. So that's my grandfather on, on the left. I've never met him, uh, but I heard plenty of stories about him. Very interesting gentleman. In case any of you are asking, so is Ng Chai Mong his name? So I'm sorry, but Ng Chai Mong is not his name. It's Wang Zai Mao, it's Xing Huang the Zai Mao. So it means that the Ngs are ever prosperous. 
and uh, so many people ask me that question, right? Is that your grandpa's name? It's not. Uh, and I'm very thankful that I'm able to continue my, my uh, grandfather's dream and story uh, from 1939 to, to where we are today and having gone through so many different crises, right, including World War II uh, and even COVID-19, you know, for now, like how are we going to reinvent ourselves uh, so that we can actually continue our business for another more 50 more years, 100 more years? What is the legacy that we are really going to We bought over the family business. So in 2008, my brother actually left his job in Tiger Beer and he joined me full time. It's, and it's been two of us ever since. So the other mission that I've set out is that I wanted to build a business with my sibling, whom I love to bits. Uh, and that's been one of the mission for between the two of us as well, to show people that actually family businesses, you can firstly thrive through three generations. Uh, in fact, I think we are thriving quite well beyond third generation, I don't know about the fourth generation, still too young to consider, but at least at the third generation, the two of us We've also shared with each other that, you know, a, a lot of people out there that yes, actually siblings can work very well together because one of the things that we've set out to do is my brother respects me as an older sister, but I respect him as the man that he is. So for his strengths, you know, and I don't just see him as a younger brother. In fact, we are equals in the business. So what we did was, um, this is our group of companies right now. So other than serving more than 5,000 over F&B establishments from like Shake Shack and Privé to your Ba Chow Mee store, likely we are there uh, with a few thousand products. We also serve all the supermarkets and all the e-commerce as well, like Red Mart. Uh, we have our own delivery fleet. So we manage uh, a fleet of more than 30 over vehicles, 100 over people in warehousing and delivery. Uh, we also run our own uh, building. So in December this year, um, it's, it was a bittersweet moment because uh, I just gave birth my number four in November and then uh, end of November and then middle of December I moved into our new building, a brand new building where we rebuilt from scratch. Um, it was a bittersweet moment because during my dad's bankruptcy case, we actually lost our building. Yeah, due to you know all the, the, the bad things that happened. So going back to a building that you own was kind of surreal and I felt that it was a turning point. Uh, on you know just to continue my dad's story as well uh, and the other thing if you didn't know we also run a agricultural business so plots is our holding company for our businesses in china we have a tea plantation and a chestnut plantation so when i say food is in my veins it it's also from the soil that we own it is a very interesting business i wouldn't encourage everybody to get into agriculture because it's not easy but um food really extends completely you know to what we do in our new building actually help the F&B industry to change, to revolutionize. It's not just about digitization, but can we help them to make their businesses better? So when our business partners um, evolve their business, right, we also will get more business. So that's something that we've taken on, you know. Uh, and of course, importantly, uh, and I'm coming to the last few slides already, which is why I'm called here today, uh, because Mayo was quite intrigued to why I actually set up the food bank, right? So one of the values that we've had is while we are very modern on the outside, if you see our company logo, no look so sleek, you know, our trucks are all black color. But one thing was key. We wanted to maintain the values that we've always had, regardless the name of the company. So it doesn't matter that we're not Wang Zai Mao anymore, but we, we retained the philosophies that our grandfather handed down to us, which is always to put a thought into everything that you do, whether is it for your employees, whether is it for the greater society, or whether is it for the industry that you're working in. So si, which is, means thought in, uh, in Chinese, right, became the value that we maintain, even in the group of companies that we have now. And having that thought, we decided to start a food bank. Um, I have to say at this juncture, the food bank nearly didn't start because the first obstacle that we had was we tried to register the name with Accra, and the officer at the other end was saying, uh, Singapore, there's no more banking license. This is a real story. I'm not kidding. So in 2012, when I was expecting my first child, 
you know, we're trying, struggling to get the name. So if we didn't push through the Food Bank Singapore in terms of registration, we would have been called the Sunshine Gang or something. Uh, still being in food banking, but that was the first obstacle. And you know, the two of us, me and my brother were, were always questioned like, hey, you know, you love each other so much that even you want to set up a charity together, don't you spend enough time together already? So um, I think in previous lives, we may have been husband and wife or something, but we, we really enjoy the momentum working as siblings. And um, the food bank has basically solidified our partnership even further because now we have something non-profitable that we are striving for together and it started as a tiny dream you know just the two of us wanting to come together because singapore throws away more than 30 percent of everything that we import and it's it's really a shame because we import up to 90 percent of everything that we consume we are one of the most affluent cities in the entire world you know we one of the highest per capita income you know, there must be something that we can do with all this excess food, right? That's on one side. And then the other side is that we definitely know that there are hungry people in Singapore. There's food insecurity, although there's no minimum wage, there's no poverty line. Being a first world country, this is something that I have to mention. We need to look at it. And so we thought, let's start with something that we're very comfortable with, which is food. And so paired with the exposure to One Singapore as well, you know, and uh, knowing what they do, and I, I didn't found that organization, but being the president, I said, okay, so there are poverty issues. You know, are we able to actually do um, something about food as well? And so when we started the food bank, it was a tiny dream of Nicholas and myself uh, coming out to say that first world country, we should have our own food bank. And um, in the first year, we actually redistributed two tons of food. And last year, we redistributed 802 tons of food. Uh, and uh, we have a small team of six full-time staff. Uh, don't tell me how we do it and don't ask me how we did it. But I must say it is the best decision of our lives to be able to start a food bank in Singapore. And it's not just because we can help fellow Singaporeans or the people who reside in this tiny island, but we genuinely feel that there is also a calling for food bank in Singapore to do something for the greater region because there are no food banks around the region in Philippines, Indonesia, and accredited food bank over there. So we thought if we get rid of food insecurity in Singapore, our next mission is to help our neighbours and to help the other countries in need as well. And I think we're on track to that. So now we have 360 charity organisations. Uh, and in fact, during COVID-19, um, we even took on a, quite a relatively special role because we had the white label. We were part of the essential business when family service centres had to close. We were allowed to open and operate. So we actually took on the task on feeding door to door as well. We've never done that before because uh, the, the nature of our business was to be a redistributor of excess food. So we actually helped other charities to feed the people on the ground. But when, uh, when the circuit breaker hit and COVID-19 hit, we had to take on the role to go door to door as well. And remember, we only had six full time staff. Uh, and at the peak of our feeding, we were actually redistributing or feeding 13,000 meals a day, uh, door to door. It was a feed that we asked ourselves, you know, how did we do it? So in a short span of seven weeks, we actually redistributed together with emergency food bundles, 502 tons of food. It's amazing in that short span of time. But one thing that really worries me at this juncture is what is the fabric of Singapore going to look like? Um, after COVID-19, you know, the unemployment um, and all that. And the first thing, if people come to you saying that they are hungry and we are so lucky to be living in Singapore because you can still get a hot meal at $3. I'm not asking you to go to MBS to eat or something, but if you go to a neighbourhood, you can still get your wonton mee, your nasi lemak at $3 and $3.50. You try to get that in the US or in Europe, you know, maybe a wash down coffee. at three dollars why is it there are still people who cannot afford to feed themselves and so we've set ourselves on a mission that our target right now is to get rid of food insecurity in singapore by 2025 so we are now on track to putting ourselves out of business uh, but COVID-19 obviously threw a spanner in the works uh, but we are still on track to understanding a lot more needs on the ground you know uh, and um that actually led me to, to creating the purpose that I have for my life, which is how do we help the greater population? How do we really get rid of the problem on the ground so that all of us can lead more fulfilling lives as well? And so we started the mission uh, with the food bank. I don't think this is the, I, I think this is just one of the charities that I'll be heading at some point. Uh, and so, in fact, 
I the last slide here is really what's in my story other than having a fifth child perhaps you know <laughs> what's the next chapter in my life you know I really don't know uh, I'm still evaluating that but for sure um, I think the next 50 years that I'll be having is going to be quite exciting yeah <laughs> thank you <laughs>